Okay, good morning. Let's begin today's lecture. So, welcome back, everybody. So, today's lecture, we're going to cover additional contents on the chain confirmation. So, let, let's review what we talked about briefly last week. Uh, we discussed about how does different chain confirmation can have potential impact on your materials property, right? Different chain uh, bond angle, et cetera. So we stopped at the point we discussed about how we should visualize the chain in three-dimensional space. And here is the slides where we talk about different bond angle, different lengths, could all influence our materials property. Okay, so today's lecture, we actually gonna begin talk a very simple model Starting talking about, let me play. Start, discuss about how we should visualize those chains in three dimensional space. And let me, application, molecular diffusion, computer science, gambling, you know, etc. in biology as well. What is random walk and what does it mean? Random walk means, um, if, if I'm standing here, every walk I'm going to take is always going to be a step forward. You want to see them, which means I will pause and throw a dice, and it will tell me if I want to walk backwards and forwards or either direction. This is a great way to think about what the polymer chains are in three-dimensional space at the beginning stage. What do I mean? So we talked about polyethylene last week. We talked about what is the overall size it could, be, it could potentially be, right? It's contour lens, et cetera. But if now we become a molecular an adder in the polyethylene chain, we can p actually has a pretty good understanding how the polymer chain is going to do by thinking about your random walk along the polymer coil itself. What do I mean by that? So this is uh, actually molecular diffusion is a surprisingly an interesting way to see. So if you're starting with a monomer one, where the next monomer gonna go could it be anywhere if it's something we call idealized chain. No restriction, it could go any direction. Pretty much like a random walk in three dimensional space. But I know the three-dimensional space is typically a little bit hard to, to a popular game called Minecraft. That, that is basically, the world is based, based uh, built upon all these cubes. You can think about how you can move around in the three-dimensional space. However, for the sake of teaching, we're going to start with very simple two-dimensional or later even one-dimensional random walk. Okay, so let's take a look at this. This shows a person is walking around this cube randomly, okay? The trace of this person walk is actually a surprisingly good representation of the polymer coil being projected into a two-dimensional space. Why? In an idealized chain, there's no constraint in bond angle, in bond rotation, and it can sit on top of each other all the time. That means it's a perfect example of random walk. If we just connect them, this would be a perfect um, polymer coil, okay? So we're going to start with the most simple one-dimensional random walk. Then we're going to help everybody understand how does the polymer behave. So let's take a look at 1D random walk. That's something we can do. I hope I bring a coin, but imagine now I have a coin in my hand. I'm going to stand here, which is zero. Imagine this is Dr. Goo now. Throw a coin if it has two opportunity. You're either going to catch a head or a tail, right? So assuming if I throw it, I got a head, what I'm going to do is give me a command that I'm going to move forward one step. If I throw again, I got a head, I'm going to move forward one step. However, if I get the tail, 
are going to go back. So let's visualize this. Let's do a couple times. Think about if I throw three times. If we have step size of, that's something we can worry about later. If we assume every time I throw, we need to take one step. And this is random, OK? This happened to be an example. I throw two head, one tail. Would everybody be happy? Probably not, right? But this gives you some idea. For infinite long chain, it's basically equals to me throwing 5,000 times. You have a DP. Where do you think I'm going to end it up? Will Dr. Gu be somehow out, walk out this classroom? And if I'm facing this direction, which we are facing? Maybe Jackson, Mississippi. Will I be end up in Jackson, Mississippi if I throw thousands of times? No. Will I be in the midtown of Hattiesburg? Maybe. Maybe. Depends if I'm lucky or not, right? If I keep throwing the tail, I'm going to be the end of that. So what is the most probable outcomes if I keep throwing? You go back where you started. Yes. Why? There's an equal probability that you'll go. Throw either way, right? Negative. Right. That's, that's exactly right. But we're going to have a distribution. There's a chance I'm going to end it here. There's a chance I'm going to end it outside in the Parliament parking lot. Depends on step number. So people can do computation simulation. So this represents where the original positions are, zero. This represents where I could possibly end in the positive position or negative position, which means I go to Jackson, Mississippi. If I keep going this direction, which is unlikely, because the throw once I ended up, um, I keep throwing at the right direction. The chance is 0.5, 50% power of how many times I throw, right? If I get throw 10 heads, I should probably consider it, go buy a lottery instead of throw 11 times, because it's unlikely to happen, but I happen to be hitting every single time. But in, so the probability to the, to the end of each spectrum going to be low, but in the center is going to be high, right? So if I have to draw it, I would have more probability in here than in both ends. If I'm counting, if I rotate, if this is a high probability, this is low probability. That's what it looks like. OK? A good example? We can also use frequency to represent where my end position with respect to different times I throw it. Why? Because it will follow a Gaussian distribution, a positive way and negative way. We're likely to cancel each other. So in other words, if there is a free joint chain, there is quite a good chance your coil will go around, but the one end, the head and tail, might end up at the same origin of your axis, right? There is a good chance of that. Of course, it depends on on um, which moment you look at it, let's assume this is a dynamic distribution. So a polymer chain will move around, wiggles around. But the end point sometimes get closer, sometimes get longer, right? So if we count end-to-end -end distance, this will be how it looks like. End-to-end -end distance? is defined by where original and the, where my start off to where I end off. And I briefly talk about this end and distance can be used to measure how big your polymer molecular, in addition to radius of gyration, another term we talked about. So these two combined together will tell you where I put the most likely ended up and the distance I travel. So this comes down to the concept of probability in terms of random walk. 
So what are we trying to do here in this fairly complex is I'm going to ask you, if I take three steps, what is the what is the probability of ending up? It's equals to all the possible pathway I'm going to take, and and my individual pathways I could possibly get, right? So in other words, if we go back, I would have a much greater probability ended up where I start off versus where I would take in the, all the positive way. And we will go into that in a little bit more detail. So let's stay on this slide for a little bit. If you look at it here, what I mean by specifically this slide is you have A, B, C. When you start off, you have three choices. And you can, and when you go to the position D, you have um, one choices, right? And well, there's only one possible end, but you have three ways to get there. So there is different way, possible way to get to that. And these defines what the chances of you being there. Let's use a little bit more, um, more easy way for everybody to understand. So let me ask, let me get, uh, OK, the chalk is right here. Let me ask everybody another example. I think easy to understand is if I take three steps, what's the chances of I ended up at the position zero and one and two and three? Let's use this as an example to talk a little bit more in depth about probability. And every time I'm going to throw, so when I start off, if I have zero step, I'm always going to be at the position zero, right? Now, if I take one step, what is the probability I'm going to have? There's only two possible outcomes. I either going to be ended up in minus 1 or plus 1, right? If I take two steps, OK, so what's the possible ways I would end up if I throw a coin twice? Is it possible I finished at the position 3? No, right? But I, I, there's possible ways I could be at. Two. Is it possible I finish at one? No, no right? Because I'm taking. Is it possible I at the zero? Yes. Absolutely yes, right? So now let's get a little bit more complex. There's going to be those combinations are possible to have. But now I'm going to ask a little bit trick question. This one. Is it possible in net zero? No, right? But how about the ways I can reach one? This is a quite a good question. There are several routes I can go there. So the probability, we're going to talk a little bit more detail here. What is it? Right. That's a very good start. So there's two ways you can reach here. You can go from either way, right? So how many different combinations I can have in three steps? I can take positive, negative, or different ways. So you can generally written as total pathway you can take. 2 power of n. In this case, it's 2 power 3, so which means I can take total different ways to do different things. 
how many chances, how many different pathways where I can get to minus three? There's only one way, right? And why this is both are one is because I need, if I need to reach three, there's only one way is if I throw once, I can get 50-50% to either one or minus one. If I throw two, I only have one way to get to minus two, but I have two ways to get to zero, right? Let me put a tiny bracket. So number two, there's only one pathway. Adding together, one, two, one is going to be equals to power of two. Okay, so if everybody learn what is um, in the mess about there, if you can simply add, this is a number one, right? And this is number one pathway to each. You basically has two approach to go there. Either you take a first negative, then take a positive, or take a positive, or take a negative. So here, you can actually have three different ways as well, and last is going to be one possible way. So this gives you some ideas about probability of reaching out to each possible path. So in the three-dimensional polymer chain, when it takes one monomer to grow it, think about free joint chain in 1D, it can go either way. Why it matters? This is a great example to explain to you why it matters. Because if we visualize our polymer to be three-dimensional random walk, this is a surprising good and simple way to count your polymer's dimension. Three-dimensional means every step you have one way to go x, y, or z. Then you just keep counting the polymer will look like this. If you are an artist, you can smooth out these sharp edges. This is a, exactly a polymer coil in 3D, OK? So random walk basically says there is no correlation between the lo any location of the walker. And each step, L is a constant, OK? What that mean? It means I am so drunk, I don't remember where I come from, I don't know where I'm going, I just a totally random guy. And don't do that. <laughs> so, other restriction. Random walk also says, can the walkers take to the location where already visited? In this, yes. In the random walk, we can take a step somebody already walked. OK? So you can go back. And the later part, we will learn another term is called self-avoiding walk. OK? Now, nothing different. If you walk one step, you plant a, a, a tree or put in something there, or put a mine, you don't want to go back to step on it again. That's something different which is more realistic in the real chain, OK? But random walk is a great start for everybody to think about and help you visualize three-dimensional polymer coil and how, the, how to start the polymer physics for this class. In this slide, we're going to cover three-dimensional random walk. We're going to introduce some concept called um, vector and scalar. So I, I don't think any, all of you might remember this, but let me emphasize the difference. What is a vector, and what is a scalar, and what's the difference? Can someone help me? Scalar. OK, go uh, ahead. Scalar has only magnitude, a uh, vector of magnitude and a direction. OK, very good start. Uh, Henry, how many of you still remember what is dot product for vector? Okay, great. That's where I'm become useful. I'm gonna help you guys. So let me explain to those who never heard about vectors. 
before the Hurricane Ida, I like to visit New Orleans. I enjoy the restaurant there. There's a place called Commander Palace. If you haven't been there and try to go there, they offer great brunch and the live music, and the food is really good. It's one of the classic called Commander Palace, okay? If I have to go there, I know I need to drive roughly about 120 miles, okay? And in addition, I need roughly know the direction I'm going. I need to drive 120 miles to the southwest uh, direction, right? So, here is it. Mississippi, here is where, I think we're, <laughs> good catch. <laughs> I was thinking, where is the Hattiesburg girl? Where Hattiesburg is, is roughly here, right? We know this, this is the New Orleans. Um, we need to go 120 miles. And we know we need to know the the distance. How many of you enjoy go out for a deep sea fishing? Some of you I see nodding the head. It's fun. So you can also go almost the south by probably eighty mile, I would say. Probably to Gulfport. Okay? You can charter a boat and go out and have a fun day for deep sea fishing. So now, I'm going to ask you, what is this distance roughly from Gulfport to New Orleans? It's not 40 miles, right? Because when we need to use a vector, you need to consider two things, direction and the magnitude. So it's, this is a roughly, should be also about 60 miles. Okay, so there's two things we need to know. Vector has a distance. Let's call this vector A. This is vector B, and this is vector C. C has a direction as well. So B vector plus C vector is going to be equals to A vector. Okay, because I not only count the distance, I count the direction. So I can claim A would be equals to B plus C, right? Simple to understand. But the value of this called absolute two line, it's basically convert this vector to a scalar. Okay, you lose the directionality, which is the arrow we put on the top of it. This means I'm gonna only convert this B to a value of 80. And this is basically means 80 distance. It doesn't have to know where we are driving. We could go 80 here or go 80 here to Jackson, Mississippi. If you take absolute, it's called absolute, you would have 60 distance from here. You will see the vector cannot, the scalar portion cannot be simply added. This is not correct, okay? So this is some fundamentals you need to know for vectors is a vector has a directionality and we need to consider directionality here. Okay, one more thing that I, I uploaded uh, readings in the canvas. So if you want to know more about the difference between the scalar and vector, how to operate them, uh, open that up in the canvas. There's a PDF file, you can read it more about it. If you have more questions, I'm happy to explain to you. So, again, I'm gonna call this AB vector. There's one more thing I want to teach everybody today or remind everybody if you already know. What about this 
dot product. This is called dot product, OK? And what this is also going to be stripping away the directionality for the vector a and 2. Let me zoom in here. This also dot product depends on the angle between those two. So if I use a dot li, what I'm going to get is a scalar. Listen carefully. No directionality. Absolute of a. So just how long this is. OK, this is basically the definition. We're going to soon need to use it in the next class to define what is the dot product when we calculate the end-to-end -end distance. OK, so let's take a look one more time. This is the how long your a is, how long b is, and cosine theta. There's more useful ways to think about this. What is more useful way? So there's physical meanings tied into this particular equation. So let's look at this part. b absolute, length of the b multiplied by cosine theta. So I need someone to help me. What is this value equals to in here? So if we magnify, if we use a different color, let me pick a different one. OK, I draw the, just a triangle. There's a uh, yellow color here. There's orange color here. So B scalar cosine theta would represent this orange color line, right? <coughs> cosine defines as this. And sine theta is basically defines the length of sine theta modified by B defines the length of this yellow line. OK. So the other way you can think about and understand is dot product is basically says, I want to know how much B vector has their component following my 